A few years ago, when we looked at printers, we saw this experimental color laser printer. It cost about $100,000. Now you can buy a laser printer for $3,000. In fact, impact and thermal printers have also shrunk in size and in price. Today, we take an updated look at printer technology, next on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by grants from AFIPS, the American Federation of Information Processing Societies, a nonprofit federation of 11 national societies for computer professionals. AFIPS, leadership and service in computer and information technology. Additional funding is provided by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover the latest in microcomputer technology worldwide. Byte the international standard. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffee, and this is Gary Kildall. Gary, I have this paperback book here, which looks like any other book you might see in a bookstore, except this book was made entirely on a Macintosh and on a laser printer. And there's a big difference between the kind of print we see here and what we're used to seeing from printers a couple of years ago. Now, Gary, a couple of years ago, we did a show on printers. And at that time, you told me that progress in printer technology would be very slow because printers depend a lot on mechanics and not on electronics. Were you wrong? <laughs> well, we're never going to get over the fact that a printer is where that electronic signal becomes ink on paper. And that's a process that hasn't been helped largely by microchip technology. However, things like laser printers are going to lead to, I think, that affordable high-resolution uh, printer. But now we're asking them to do high-resolution color graphics as well. So that just adds another problem to it. <laughs> Gary, on today's program, we're going to see the latest in laser printers, in color printers. We'll see the new printers from IBM. And we'll take a look at software packages, which help you get the most out of your printer. First of all, we're going to take a look at a company now that does all its publishing in-house because it has a computer and a high-end printer. The effectiveness of a document depends on the visual impact it makes on the reader. As a result, most companies with in-house publishing departments depend heavily on their graphic artists for attractive publications. There are numerous drawbacks to this dependence, like the obvious typewriter look of the text and the tedious manual paste-up of drawings and diagrams. But the rough edges of on-the-spot publishing are getting a lot smoother with the help of new software and a great leap in printer technology. The flexibility of a word processor has been extended to integrate graphics with print-like text for some remarkable results. On this high-resolution screen, an operator can choose from a large number of font sizes and styles and mix them with extensive graphics to create an integrated package. What he sees on the screen matches what comes out of the printer. Data-driven business charts, diagrams, even external artwork and photos can be pasted up with aesthetic precision. While office computers may have reduced the need for some paperwork, the demand for computer-generated hard copy continues to grow. In 1983, two and a half billion pages of computer printout were produced in the world. By 1989, that figure is expected to grow to over four billion pages. As the gap between in-house and professional publishing narrows, the quality of office documents will make it more and more difficult to tell the difference between typewriter and typesetter. With us now is Bob Lamvik, Regional Sales Manager of Oki Data, and next to Bob, John Dickinson, Special Projects Editor with PC Magazine, and John was the editor of the magazine's recent special edition on printers. John, in uh, 1975, I remember when I was buying printers that you'd buy a teletype printer to <laughs> do your listings and a Diablo high type uh, to do your letter quality stuff, and that added up about $5,000. Now, I understand that you reviewed about 200 different kinds of printers. What are the, just from a user standpoint, what are the different categories that you'd find printers? Well, you can divide printers into categories in a couple of ways. You could go by price, for example, Gary, and you can go down as low as about $100, or you can go as high as eight or nine, or maybe even $12,000 pretty soon. Um, that's one way to divide the price. You can still divide 
by those low quality printers, like you were talking about the teletype versus high quality, the Diablo, but even that's not, no longer simple because um, what used to be considered low quality printers, matrix printers, are now perfectly capable of producing very acceptable correspondence quality. Matrix technology has gone into the non-impact field and we now have thermal printers and laser printers which are really matrix printers. And of course those Diablo style printers are still in there, the daisy wheels and thimble printers are making a big dent in everybody's market. So mm -hmm. it's a wide open field. Mm -hmm. Bob, let's uh, turn to you and this Oki Make 20, which is probably the extreme from what you were talking about, Gary, in the good old days. This is probably one of the newest, hottest things around. And I know it takes some time, so could you fire up the Oki Make 20? Because sure. we're going to take a look at, uh, will you tell us what, what that's going to print out? Well, the, the Oki Make 20 here is going to print out a color screen dump. Uh, the Oki Make 20 is a, one of the lower end price range printers. It's under $300, and it uses a thermal transfer technology. Now, I'll quickly point out that that is not thermal. A lot of people in this industry think of thermal printers, which is a technology that's been around for two or three or four years. This is a new technology where we're actually moving a, a waxed ribbon an ink onto plain paper. Mm -hmm. You'll see when we get the output in a few minutes, it's uh, glorious colors, uh, vibrant, and uh, really comes out nicely. Now, Gary, we, sitting behind the Oki Mate is one of the new IBM Quiet writers. And John, you mentioned the fact that the dot matrix isn't quite dot matrix, and you've got quiet, and uh, you've gotten away from impact problems. Could you fire that one up, okay, Gary? Let, let's see. Let's listen <laughs> to a quiet writer and see how quiet okay. it is. Okay, there it goes. Now, John, why don't you kind of give us a description of the Quiet Writer while it's working there? The Quiet Writer is similar to the Oki Mate in that it's a thermal transfer printer. Um, using an electronic technology to thermally transfer an ink from a wax base ribbon onto the paper. Uh, it's a higher grade machine, naturally it costs more, it's about $1,400. It has higher resolution and its standard mode of operation is in correspondence quality, which the Oki Mate 20 can also do. Um, the newest version of the Quiet Writer also includes graphics, which again is an Oki Mate feature, um, but the Quiet Writer does not have the color feature of the Oki Mate 20. It's definitely an interesting thing to sit here in an impossible scene two years ago. We have two Matrix printers running at the same time and are holding a conversation <laughs> at just normal, <laughs> over-the-desk levels. We're not screaming at each other. Now, the, uh, is the Daisy Wheel printer dead? You talked about, well, there's still a lot of them cranking away, but we look at this technology and it seems to make the Daisy Wheel a kind of dinosaur. I'm one of those people who just doesn't think dinosaurs are going to go away that easily. Uh, if it were truly dead, new brands would not be coming out, and new brands are coming out. Um, new and less expensive printers are coming. You're getting more for your money today, and they're also getting to be much faster. There are daisy wheel printers now that are capable of 50 and 60 characters per second on a throughput basis. That was unheard of a couple of years ago. Uh, they're still being made. They're still selling well. The only difficulty you have with the daisy wheel printers is in the new software, such as your gem and, and other products, Microsoft's Windows, which basically require a graphics-based printer to operate correctly. And that's where, if those software packages take off and really do a lot, those printers are in trouble. Mm -hmm. Okay, now what, and are they going to suffer, even the new printers that say would be adaptable to Windows or Jam or the uh, high-resolution graphics, are they going to be uh, you know, high speed, or are we going to be left with a situation like this where all of our letter quality stuff is going to come out at this rate just because it's graphics based. Um, at the risk of sounding like a wise guy, the answer is yes, because you're going to have a range of speeds and qualities just like you do today. Um, you're also going to have a range of compatibility standards which will make some printers work better than others with those products. And you're going to have just as many choices and probably just as much confusion in, in terms of what exactly to buy as you do today. And we'll probably be doing the same thing in two years at PC Magazine, where we'll take another 100 printers or 120 or 200, whatever it turns out to be, and work them with more of a graphics orientation probably two years down the road than we do now. Bob, there's one question that I have is uh, how important is um, color in printing? I mean, is it a novelty, or is it something that we're, is really going to be an important part of the future generation? All are going to have color? It was black and white enough. Well, I think it's, it's fair to say that color is an up-and-coming technology, and especially in printers. Prior to, let's say, 1985, the biggest uh, downfall in color graphics on a printer was software compatibility. One of the ways that's been addressed on the OkiMate is the, the customers purchase a generic printer, and then they buy a personality module, which slides in the side of the printer. 
With the personality module comes two diskettes. One is a learn to print tutorial diskette. The other is a color screen print utility that's created this output. Let's take a look at the output for a second while you've got it. The, uh, the color screen print utility is a device that lets you rotate you can size the uh, object to whatever uh, aspect ratio you're looking for. You can change the colors. And that now is included with the printer. So to summarize it, anything you can get on the screen, you can output on the Okimate 20 very easily. John, quickly, you had that kind of critic smile when Gary <laughs> asked his question. What's the short answer to that question from your view? It's a big if. A lot of people keep saying the color printers are really important. I think the Okimate 20 and its ilk of printers can prove it because at the kind of price that they're charging for that printer, there's just no excuse not to have one as a second printer. So if that printer really takes off with the kind of software they're providing and support they're providing for the IBM PC, for example, then I think there's a good shot at, at determining whether color printing is that important or not. Okay, gentlemen, now in just a minute, we're going to see the newest laser printer from Hewlett Packard, so stay with us. Joining us now is Chuck Ulfers, the marketing manager for the printer division at Hewlett Packard. Chuck, we were just looking at one new printer technology, thermal transfer. This is another uh, new printer technology, laser printers. What goes on inside a laser printer? Well, actually, Stuart, the technology of a laser printer is very similar to the technology that's used in a photocopy machine. Uh, the image is actually transferred to a photoconductive drum using a laser. The drum's then rotated past a station that applies a powdered plastic or a toner. That toner is then transferred to the paper and actually melted or fused into the, into the paper. Uh, Chuck, can you get the printer running here and just to a uh, answer a couple of questions about things like speed, the cost of the machine, the cost of operation, things like that, so we can compare it with the other printers? Sure. Uh, the LaserJet is an eight page per minute device. Uh, it sells for $29.95. Mm -hmm. It prints uh, in either direction on the page. It is, has the ability to put a number of different uh, fonts on a single page. Mm -hmm. and, uh, what about the, the cost of, uh, let's say, per page copy? The per page cost is somewhere between five and seven cents. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now this uh, particular page right here has, I notice has, a, looks just very much like a, uh, a typeset page. Uh, that seems to be one of the big advantages of the laser printer over some of the others. Uh, that's correct. Uh, laser printers today have a very high resolution, typically about 300 dots per inch, and that gives us the ability to do very nice artwork and graphics. Uh, the print that you see here actually has a number of different sizes of uh, font. They ha it has a graphic. It has proportionally spaced text. Uh, that's one of the strong capabilities that the product has brought into the office marketplace. Mm -hmm. One of the other abilities that it has is the ability to do a form. This one's a very popular it's one, the 1040 form. <laughs> form, which is certainly attractive in the accounting marketplace. We also have the ability to do graphics with this mm -hmm. sort of a product. Now, Chuck, I've, had, I've heard the uh, name of the Canon engine uh, mm -hmm. quoted in, in the context of laser printers. What does Canon have to do with this whole development? Well, uh, as I said earlier, the technology is based on the same technology as photocopy mm -hmm. machines. And so you will find that in most cases, the photocopy companies are the ones that have a uh, early presence in the marketplace. Canon has been particularly successful in that a number of machines in the marketplace today are currently based okay, on their this, technology. Does this uh, use the Canon engine then? This is product that, uses okay. the Canon engine, that's yeah, what, correct. What would some of the other uh, typical uh, um, laser printers be? Some of the other products that you may be familiar with, the Apple Laser Writer mm -hmm. uses the Canon engine, the QMS printer uh, is based on the Canon engine, and there are a number of others in mm -hmm. the marketplace. Chuck, why would people want to spend the $3,000, say, to buy a laser printer? What are the main features that, that the user would look for in buying something like this? Well, uh, interestingly enough, our studies show that the primary reason that people buy a product like this one is because it's very quiet, it has a very high quality output, and it's very fast. Um, we expect that over time the market will evolve to a more uh, sophisticated appreciation of the graphics capabilities of these products, but certainly in the office, those are the reasons why people buy them. Now, are we, are we going to see a smaller version of this thing for, say, the, the home computers, the personal computers, <laughs> and less cost? I'm sure you will see the technology continue to evolve mm -hmm. downward, both in cost and in size. And size what is a uh, time frame would that be? Uh, I would expect to see that continue to move down uh, 
continuously. We <laughs> actually, this is a second generation of this product. It's less than 18 months old. So mm -hmm. I think uh, it'll move rather rapidly. You know, already now, with obviously with output like this, the laser printers are radically changing the publishing business and the graphics business. Our reporter, Wendy Woods, went out and took a look at a graphics house which has nothing but PCs and laser printers. For centuries, the pencil, the ruler, and the knife have been the major graphics tools, until one year ago. This is the first shop in the U.S. to exploit the Macintosh, LaserWriter, and PageMaker software by Aldus. TechArt of San Francisco does virtually all its typesetting, from flyers to books, by computer. The computer does the drudgery of paste-up and layout, leaving humans to the more creative tasks. You still have to have uh, an eye for design, I see these really more as tools. We're just using different tools, and they're a little faster, and they, they really take out, from my way of thinking, they really take out the, more the mundane aspects of traditional techniques. But you still have to pay attention to what you're doing, and uh, in fact, we've had artists here who, who feel that their, their uh, illustration capabilities have improved from using the Mac. There are two other advantages to computerized typesetting. New employees can pick up graphic skills quickly, meaning less training time for the shops. And the basic equipment, which turns out camera-ready galleys and originals, costs a fraction of conventional typesetting gear. TechArt's success is inspiring people to call every week to ask for help in starting their own computerized typesetting businesses. Of course, who benefits by all of this? Customers. Customers get their work a lot faster and a lot cheaper. TechArt priced the cost of an 8.5 by 11 flyer and found that conventional shops charge five to six times more than they did, which speaks for itself. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Wendy Woods. This looks like a real clear move from uh, old style character printers into something where we can really use the full graphics capability. Yeah, we're going to get into some more of this, Gary. Joining us now is Dr. John Warnock, co-founder and president of Adobe Systems, Inc., the developers of something called PostScript. And back with us, of course, John Dickinson from PC Magazine. Gary? Okay, John, it appears that if we take the idea of a, uh, just a pure ASCII printer and the common codes that have been used for line feeds, foreign feeds, and so forth, that's really helped a whole industry evolve. Uh, there's around some standards, very simple standards. Now, uh, you've got a product that does that same sort of thing for, let's say, high-resolution graphics uh, laser printers. Is that right? That's right. Uh, PostScript is actually the magic that sort of sits inside of the laser printer and what it wants to do is it wants to take the description of a printed page and that description includes text, typesetting command kinds of things, things to describe shapes, photographs, anything you can imagine that can be printed on a page can be described in this language that really describes what the page is looking now, like. Now this language wouldn't be one a language that say an end user would operate with, but it would be say at a program interface level, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, PostScript is designed to be emitted by application programs, uh, chart making programs, mm -hmm. graphics programs, CAD CAM programs, and what the idea is is that you take this description of the page over the communication wire to the printer that description is interpreted and actually the marks that are on the paper are determined by that description. Okay, now as long as you get a, a let's say, a wide variety of uh, printer manufacturers that adhere to that, then you're in good shape as far as standards, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, our, our company sort of offers the product to a wide variety of printer manufacturers and we're finding that this has been very well accepted because it is a device independent description that it can allow many different resolution devices to be driven from the pa same page description. John, do you think this is a good approach? Oh, yes. The, the character printers, the standards that you mentioned were the very simple ones were accepted for a long time, but when it came to things like in print enhancements, bold facing and underlining and things like that, standards just didn't exist. And it's only recently that we've seen a convergence on three or four major standards. Uh, a product like Adobe has a chance of standardizing lasers before it gets out of control because even now, for as well accepted as Adobe has been, other vendors such as Hewlett Packard can and have adopted other standards that are totally different from Adobe and I have a, a strange sense that we'll go through the same incompatibility all over again. 
Well, the other thing that sort of appears to, to uh, be the case is that this kind of PostScript uh, interface could be used uh, in a sense to uh, maybe even encroach mm -hmm. on the whole typesetting industry. Is that really true? Absolutely. Uh, PostScript was designed with the graphic arts industry in mind. Mm -hmm. In other words, it does do half tones, it does do full typefaces, ligatures, <laughs> kerning, all the words that the typesetting industry has mm -hmm. been familiar okay. with. John, you've got some examples there, I think, of something out of a laser printer and, and comparing it to what really comes out of a typesetter. Show us that. Yes. Uh, on the on the right here, this is a, a form that was designed and printed on the Apple Laser Writer, and on the left hand side, and this is excuse me, this is done at 300 spots to the inch. On the right hand side, this comes out of a Linotronic typesetter at 1,200 spots to the inch, and this one is appropriate for day to day use in the office. This one is appropriate for high volume printing print runs. And the major advantage of this now is that it's the same basic application program that. Uh, that produced this is the one that produced the, this. The file that told the printer what to print on this page is identical to the file that told the printer what to print on this page, except they're in an entirely different resolution. John, will we ever see that kind of resolution coming out of a laser printer? Uh, this is it. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I think so, we both hope so a <laughs> lot. Uh, this currently is what you can get for three to five or six thousand dollars. Two or three years from now, perhaps you'll be able to get that at the same kind of economical price. Is there any competition for the standard, let's say, for a printer interface? Do you have other, are there other uh, software companies, say, that are producing this kind of an interface? Uh, Xerox is promoting a, a standard mm -hmm. description language called Interpress, and as a matter of fact, I was part of the design team for Interpress. Mm -hmm. uh, John, I'm sorry, you would have more? No, that was <laughs> okay. it. John Dixon, we have just about a minute left. Uh, just quickly, about some of the other cutting-edge printer technologies. We hear about magnetic, LED, LCD. What's happening beyond the laser printer? Well, the, they're just at the back of the crest of the wave, and we're hoped they're up on the cutting edge of the wave by the end of the year. We're seeing array printers being announced, and they should be out, we were told, of course, fourth quarter of this year. We hope certainly first quarter of next year to see some products from both the East and West Coast companies and from both the Japanese and American companies. Mm -hmm. real, real quickly, what's the advantage of an array printer over the laser printer? Fewer moving parts. The, the laser printer has the rotating mirror, and the array printers don't have mm -hmm. such a device. The, the no, smaller number of moving parts, the less the cost is going to be. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, Gary, maybe we'll come back in two years again and uh, take <laughs> another look at printers. <laughs> who, who knows what we'll see. Now, how do we sum up all of this changing technology in printers? We're going to turn to our commentator, Paul Schindler, for his thoughts. To you or me, a printer. To the computer nerd, a hard copy output device. If we were to look inside, we'd see gears and pulleys. Yes, it's the printer, the last mechanical outpost in an increasingly digital and electronic world. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm as anxious as the next person to move on to some completely electronic output device with no moving parts that'll be as cheap and dependable as all the other components in a computer system. But until then, being a basically mechanical creature like all human beings, I find it reassuring that no matter how fancy input gets or how fast the computer calculates, in the end, they're of relatively little use until they can get it down on paper, a mechanical process. I'm reminded of the oft-repeated dictum of the office automation consulting business that the paperless office is about as likely as the paperless bathroom. Few people realize that computers create more, not less paper, in most offices in which they appear. Printed matter and business graphics are increasingly vital to the function of almost every business in America. Of course, both can be done by hand rather than by computer. But you could also get across town with a horse and buggy. Would you want to? I wouldn't. That's my opinion. I'm Paul Schindler. I'm Susan Chase, sitting in for Stuart Chaffe, and the random access file this week, Sperry Corporation introduced another PCAT clone. The new Sperry PCIT is faster and offers more memory than the IBM model. It also runs Unix, allowing it to accommodate more users than the PCAT. Sperry's entry joins about a dozen and a half other computer companies already marketing PCAT lookalikes. Rumor has it that Hewlett Packard will also announce a high quality, competitively priced PCAT clone shortly. AT&T has unveiled a system that will let people gain computerized stock information simply by speaking into their telephones. Instead of typing into a computer or punching buttons on a touchtone phone, a synthesized voice will ask a caller what information is desired, retrieve it, and read it. A Boston-based brokerage house will be the first company to try out this service next month. Users will be able to attain quotations at any time for some 6,000 stocks. Lotus Development is also entering the stock business. Lotus introduced a new 
hardware and software package called Signal that gets financial quotes through a radio receiver and stores them in a personal computer. Besides receiving stock quotes, Signal alerts its users to key price movements of a favorite stock with a loud beep, hence the name Signal. Lotus made news with another event this week. A serious flaw has been detected in the new Symphony 1.1 program, leading Lotus to recall all the boxes on the shelves. Lotus became aware of problems after users complained that some data disappeared when they performed common tasks on the program's spreadsheets. Present owners of Symphony will receive a floppy disk next month that will enable them to correct the problem. And now for another colorful review, here's Paul Schindler. Fish bowls are popular for one simple reason. They provide hours of mindless entertainment. Well, this is PC Color. Now, you may say to yourself, just what I need, an electronic fishbowl. Well, I'm not saying anyone's going to rush out and buy a personal computer just to run this program. But whether you use your PC at work or at home, you've surely noticed you can't use it all the time. When you aren't using it, its big empty eye stares at you, just like a dead TV set. In between programs, why not flip on PC Color? I find it soothing and interesting. For you technical types, it stays in text mode, increasing the number of colors it can display. You can make the colors go faster or slower, you can freeze them, and you can change the color scheme. Watch it while you're on the phone. There are two versions of PC Color. If you don't mind copy protection, it's yours for $35. If, like me, you prefer a program you can use, pay $44. Either way, PC Color is a bargain from a firmware in Drexel Hill, Pennsylvania. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Paul Schindler. Neither Commodore nor Atari will be among the exhibitors at the Consumer Electronics Show in January. Though both are waging an intense battle over consumer dollars, neither plans to participate in the Las Vegas show, which attracts some 50,000 key retailers. Many companies believe that the advent of the computer would be the end of the paper chase. It seems corporate America was wrong. In fact, the American Paper Institute reports that the market for office paper grew over 5% annually from 1972 to 1984, when the move to office automation was in full swing. Some companies say the higher paper consumption is the result of computers making it easier to produce more originals. Finally, for those of you who are frustrated with your Apple II, there's a new product for you. Jeff Raskin of Information Appliance has created a plug-in board called SwiftCard, which simplifies computer operations. There's no startup procedure, no disk to load, and no need for separate word processing programs. Users simply turn on their computers and begin typing. It may not take advantage of the microprocessor, but it certainly beats using your 2E as a plant stand. That's it for this edition of the Computer Chronicles. Tune in again next time. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by grants from AFIPS, the American Federation of Information Processing Societies, a nonprofit federation of 11 national societies for computer professionals. AFIPS, leadership and service in computer and information technology. Additional funding is provided by McGraw Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover the latest in microcomputer technology worldwide. Byte the international standard.